Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen West. Welcome to the Partially Examined Life After Show. I'm here with two of my closest friends, Dylan and David. Uh, man, it, it, we're here to talk about Alfred North Whitehead today. I, I guess maybe we should introduce so that people can get a voice to the actual name for the preceding conversation. It'll help keep things organized. Dylan, how are you today? I'm doing well, Stephen. How are you? I'm fantastic, and I got to do this through disingenuous conversation. I apologize to everybody listening. Nobody really cares about uh, how these people are doing. David, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Um, I'd like to say that the I'm going to put an emphasis on the about Whitehead part. Definitely going to talk around him because I really don't know much about Whitehead. Yeah. Yes, I, just, I know something about other process philosophers, so I thought maybe that would be worth something. Well, you're the best we have at this point. Uh, so he, here's the thing. I'd like to thank everybody that became a citizen last week following the after show that we did before on Jaspers. I'd like to uh, thank everybody that listened. And this is going to kind of be an ongoing evolution. As long as these things continue, we're going to keep learning from our mistakes. And one lesson that we learned last time is that there needs to sort of be a launching pad for the rest of the discussion. So that said, I would like to give my thoughts on a couple things and maybe pose a question to Dylan, and I mean, that can serve as sort of a, uh, a, a starting point. What do you guys think about that? Is that all right? Sure, please. That's what we'll do. All right, Alfred North Whitehead. All right. I remember I was thinking about something to do with Yelp. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember now. Have you guys, okay, David and Dylan, have you guys ever been to Yelp.com before and checked out a review about some restaurant that you wanted to go to? Now, what did you see when you went to that website? Well, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you what you saw. What you saw was a conglomeration of the most <laughs> detestable, overly critical people in the world that leave <laughs> reviews about stuff, and they've long since been disowned by their parents, so they have plenty of time. Uh, but these people leave reviews on the website, right? They say horrible things about it. Actually, they say good things, too. Uh, here's what I'm getting at. Ultimately, what you're seeing on Yelp.com is a collection of how individual minds have experienced Burger King in the past. If Burger King's the restaurant that they're going to leave a review about. They've done this with all sorts of, of augmentations and handicaps. You know, handicaps meaning one of them might have had some sort of seeing impairment or hearing impairment. They've written their synopsis at home in all sorts of different emotional states. If you were trying to do an unbiased documentary on Burger King, Yelp.com would not be the place that you go to try to arrive at gathering unbiased facts. Right? This is a very crude example of what I think is an insight that underlies all of Whitehead's subsequent work, that if science wants to conduct any sort of meaningful inquiry at all, they should stop thinking about it in terms of how the mind perceives the natural world and start thinking about it uh, in terms of what the natural world actually is. Now, it was through this faulty assumption that we arrived at the idea that substance is a placeholder, you know, the, the idea of substance, substance as a placeholder, and then from there we mistakenly just accepted it as the truth. Now, from here in the discussion, there's any number of directions we can go. You guys can do whatever you want. But first, Dylan, as a celebrity particle physicist, as a Stephen Hawking's friend and mentor, uh, the man who single-handedly revolutionized quantum mechanics, would you mind if I picked your brain about my layman's pathetic distortion of modern physics that might validate Whitehead's metaphysics and it can serve as that launching pad that I talked about before? Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? Uh, sure. Man, I can't I wait. I don't mind. I don't I, mind. I've been waiting to glean your wisdom for like two weeks now, I, as soon as I read Whitehead. All right, so here's the way I understand it. And please correct me as soon as I'm done. We, we have this assumption that the universe is made up of independent physical things made up of substances that interact with each other, right? This, this underlying substance that we can't see because of the limitations of our eyes as human beings, and that substance is responsible for all of the attributes that we assign to it. But, and here's my tremendously flawed way of understanding it, when you're holding a piece of newspaper, right, and you light the piece of newspaper on fire, and it, it, it burns, and it smokes, and it disappears into the sky. That newspaper doesn't cease to exist just because you lit it on fire, right? Like, that newspaper is, is just a physical representation of energy. And when you light it on fire, it's converted into heat energy that goes in, in, into the atmosphere, and it goes and lives like heat energy does for the rest of its days. But it, it's not gone. It just has been converted from one type of energy to another type of energy. So... 
you can look at atoms and break down atoms into neutrons and protons and electrons. Electrons aren't even physical, I think they've realized now. They keep coming and going into different dimensions, popping in and out of existence. You break neutrons and protons up, they become quarks and things like these immaterial things. So is what Whitehead is talking about ultimately that relationship between energy is responsible for these physical things that are around us as opposed to there being some sort of substance that we can attribute to that. I'm done. Yeah, I think I think that when you started uh, re articulating the question about the newspaper, you immediately began giving a kind of Whiteheadian response, process philosophy kind of response to um, substances, and that uh, they really are arrangements of things coming and going and evolving and changing and that the flaw is that that Whitehead's trying to you know point us away from is that you have materials you have a sort of a building block universe made up of some number of fundamental entities that are bound together by um, forces or properties or characteristics of those entities and out of that you get all of the actions and interactions of the world and um, and that that was sort of the flawed way you wanted to talk about um, uh, the newspaper and then your response I think was you know seemed like whitehead to me a really? version of, a version of whitehead yeah so this energy is not just I mean thinking about the fundamental reality as it truly exists, or as Whitehead proposes it truly exists. Thinking about it in terms of energy's relation to each other, and this, this non-material stuff's relationship to each other, and then that being represented in physical form, that's not an oversimplification? Because I thought you were just going to lay into me right here. Tell me that I didn't know what I was talking about, and uh, no? Uh, no, I mean, I think there's a, maybe some more to say and more interesting discussion to talk about material and the kind, and what um, Whitehead is responding to in this kind of very Newtonian world and whether or not the entities in quantum mechanics like an electron, what we mean by the material of that electron or not and and how that's manifest. But but the short answer is no. I think that you know the notion that the world is made up of energies that interact that are that are interacting and coalescing and coming in and out and you know sort of some kind of roughly quantum field theory view of the world is and that interpretation of it is you know that's 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 whitehead but that's also a lot of other kind of or, or you know ecologically organ organis, organ organism um Dylan are you right? drunk right now <laughs> no, I'm okay. no I'm not would it let me see if I, I'm following this. It, very roughly speaking, Aristotle's notion of substance has been evolved and has now been translated into scientific physicalism. Okay. Yeah. Is that about right? And so, you know, scientific realism is going to take physical ent entities to be something like the ultimate substance, the real thing that they're trying to get at. Yeah, I, I think that there's a, a sub-discussion in realism which has to do with whether or not those fundamental ent entities are substances um, or, yeah, or, or, or materials in sort of the normal way we think, we think of it. I mean, the typical way, like when you think of an atom, would be it's just a smaller version of something we interact with every day, you know, and little billiard ball kind of thing. Yeah, a little tiny ball, yeah. And uh, it's true, and I think this is one of the reasons why Whitehead wants to point to, in the concept of nature, he wants to point to special relativity. And, you know, he wrote that book before quantum mechanics. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, but that field, th that field theoretical understanding that, he, that he's, you know, interpreting on gravitation is also, you know, going to show up even though it doesn't get unified, isn't unified with um, gravity in terms of quantum field theory, uh, and 
uh, understanding the world and the universe as being. Hello, Nicholas. This on one hand forms. I, I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. Yeah. Maybe we call it physicalism now instead of materialism because this recognition that um, physical, the physical universe isn't just mass, but all kinds of forces that don't involve yeah, part, actual part, hardness, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and part of the realism is the notion that, well, atoms actually exist or electrons actually exist. It's not just an idea that there's a correspondence between what we're talking about in, um, in our their mathematical account and the world um, and and that the, the, that that correspondence is holds up that's part of the realism um, that's there and uh, this is of part of what Whitehead is disputing right the the correspondence theory kind of takes a hike uh, 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 with the process philosophy doesn't it I mean it, I know it does in the case of James and Persig I just assume it would with Whitehead as well, because he's getting at what do they call the the vicious bifurcations? Isn't he talking about the bifurcation between subject and object? And that's the sort of the underlying premise behind the correspondence theory of truth. Yeah, I think his intention is for it to take a hike. I don't know if it necessarily does. I think that uh, I mean, it's, I mean, even during his time, didn't people say that nobody really understood his philosophy that well? And I mean, he he. I remember hearing a story about him giving a lecture at Harvard one time, like once he got tenure there, and uh, you know, like 120 people came to the lecture, and by the end of it, nobody understood what he was talking about. In fact, I think there was some guy that said that uh, if if I didn't know that this guy was a genius, I would have mistaken him as somebody that was just making it up as he went along. Yeah, and I then he, that. he he gave a lecture the next week or you know a month later or something, and only six people came to it or something. I mean that is just that is very illuminating of just how little how few people truly understood what this guy was even talking about. I think it it is a hallmark of Whitehead just how uh, you know ahead of his time he was really. I wonder if the concepts that he's trying to get across are really so difficult to understand. Or if it's just sort of the, a language problem, you can't. I mean, I just can't tell what he's saying. I'm not. Dis, I can't dispute it or or uh, criticize it or agree with it because I just don't know what he's saying. Uh, the meaning of his sentences eludes me, so I can't. I sort, I sort of can't get to the ideas. I have to get you know from secondary sources and comparisons, and even then, I don't have the vaguest idea that it's similar to other process philosophers. Just sounds kind of familiar, you know. Yeah, I I honestly feel bad because last one of these after shows it was on Jasper's, and I feel like he's another elusive uh, philosopher. He's tough to get a complete grasp on, and I just feel bad that two times in a row now I feel <laughs> as though I don't have a total understanding of exactly what this guy is talking about. It was very difficult for me to read. We were talking before the broadcast started about the fact that I've heard from people that this is uh, that reading Whitehead is. I mean, people have said that it's the most difficult reading in all of Western philosophy. Now, obviously, uh, Dylan disagrees with that. People di can disagree with that. But for me, it was very difficult. I don't understand the nuts and bolts of all of his stuff about the relationship of space and time to the way that we perceive it. And, I mean, I, I honestly feel bad. Well, I, I guess we can... There's a... Without having the ambition of grasping all of his thought. I mean, part of the challenge there is that we've read one book of his and, um, you know, it's not, the concept of nature is not, you know, his, you know, uh, it's not process and reality, which is sort of his, his big tome that in principle is supposed to summarize everything. But uh, I think that you can get a couple different pieces of what he's going after. And I think we've already touched on one of them. One is reacting to uh, Aristotelian materialism, or a particular version of that that David brought up, and the idea that the universe is made up of individual entities that have their own 
permanent eternal integrity and properties and that the resulting uh, variety in the world is due to those arrangements of those permanent unchanging entities with properties and their interactions and he so that Whitehead disagrees with that the notion of these uh, you know these permanent unchanging physical entities that um, and that those core and so that's that's one part of it and I think the other is trying in his case trying to link up the notion of a of uh, the way we so how, uh, the way we come up with objects in the world if everything is really fluid underneath the under uh, underneath and how we our experience of some kind of permanence is really illusion is on the one hand illusory but on the other hand has content so he wants to talk a lot more about comings and goings of things and how uh, uh, the interactions in the world um, uh, end up aggregating so that we have the experience in time and space of an object that seems to have permanence but that is somewhat illusory in that it's it's actually constantly changing that if you look at the box or the table or whatever and you go out of the room and you come back come back in the room and it's still there it's uh, we have this, uh, it's not in this book, but we have, uh, it's with the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Right. Where we think that it is a concrete, unchanging object that maybe we can cut up or whatever, and uh, but it's not. It's actually constantly changing, constantly moving, on, and it's a kind of illusion of our perspective that we don't, see it, pay attention to the fact that it's constantly moving. And he would point to something in like quantum mechanics that would actually reveal that to us. That, that you know, if you went and looked at the table very, very closely, you'd see actually all the atoms are moving around in some way or another at different levels of magnitude. And it's constantly changing that there are, there are particles boiling off of it and, uh, and shapes of it are changing. And so the um, rigidity and permanence of it is is uh, a manifestation of, you know, of the slice of time we're looking at and how far away we are from it, and yeah. we're not as sensitive to the way in which it's constantly changing. And he wants to, um, I think, the simple way to say it is that he thinks that the only way we can account for change is to understand that change is uh, the fundamental thing. The motion is the fundamental thing in the universe, and that the um, and that permanence and entities are a manifestation of our experience of that change, rather yeah. than rather than those entities and objects are the fundamental things, and them changing is a um, is on top of that. It's really motion and flux are mm -hmm. the primary thing, and that the entities that arise out of that, those are impermanent manifestations. Yeah, I'm glad you said flux, because it reminds me a lot of Heraclitus when I hear yes. him talking yes. about it. This is, I don't know if he was influenced by him or not, I guess it doesn't even matter. But this is something that I want to ask you, you guys about so that we can get, I, this, this, like, this veil of perception, this thing that precludes us from arriving at, or seeing this underlying nature, uh, for, for what it actually is, but we end up seeing it as all of these attributes and f seemingly physical things. And Like, science's goal is to arrive at conclusions about causes within nature or some facsimile of truth based on induction. And if that is our primary means as a species of arriving at conclusions about the natural world, I, I think something that Whitehead alludes to, and it's something that's very interesting to me, is that what if this underlying nature is something that we can never experience, ever, and we'll ultimately always be in a state of ignorance? Have, you guys think of that when you read Whitehead? The, the, the limitations of science, and by understanding them, we can improve that process. Or maybe we can't. I, I, might, I might be confused about this, but I'm thinking that the true things that 
science is searching for are abstractions and theories that are mistaken um, for concrete realities. That, that his criticism, this fallacy of misplaced concreteness, is about mistaking our own abstractions for real entities. And, and so if, if reality is constantly in a state of flux and if it's constantly flowing, then the only thing that you get that, that's like permanent object kind of thing is our idea that we abstract from the flux. And, and then we believe that the object is real rather than it's just a handy way for our, us to think about the re, you know, this persistent quality where the thing keeps showing up in our stream of experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah it, does that make sense? I mean, that's it, 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 sad, but... No, no but it, it does make sense. But I also, I think, worth pointing out is that I don't think Whitehead has any problem with the idea of us um, uh, abstracting out those objects and talking about them and even writing equations based on them and doing measurements of the world based on them. And in that way, I felt like he's very pragmatic. He's got a big streak of pragmatism running through him. They're like, well, this is we have to talk about the world in terms of entities and objects. It's perfectly sensible to do that. But he wants to, uh, he sees a richness to the world based upon looking at it as a constantly evolving process that to him is the very source of our ability to do science. That in some ways, if the world is materialist in the way uh, he's, he's criticizing, then that points to an end of an end to the scientific process that just is objectionable that you know it would mean that you could figure it out rather than it being a constant process of refinement and i think he's much more on board with the idea of it being refined and that the fact that it's a uh, that the universe is made up of motion it really saves scientific inquiry. It saves the, the uh, it gives us a source for what we're actually looking for. We're looking for, uh, you, know, I, you know, we can always go to the well and, and try to figure out more about the world. And we may end up revising it in ways that are small or maybe ways that are fundamental. But it's because the universe is made up of, um, of motions and 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 change that that is really the, the source of uh, our ability to uh, go back to the well infinitely open to interpretation so to speak yes and and it's not the same thing as saying that they're all equal but that again it's it's that it's um, it's infinitely rich in that respect so on one hand, science could just be chasing a ghost because it's constantly trying to define... I mean, the nature of science is, is to define something, but you can't define something that's constantly moving ever exactly. And then the other end of that is that based on our own limitations, just our sensory abilities and how crude they are, we might not be able to arrive at what the underlying substance is that we're trying to define at all. I guess I'm wondering, does that... If we accept Whitehead's worldview, does that make science not necessarily obsolete, but seem as though it is kind of obsolete because we're always just trying to define it based on attributes that we're seeing in the world, or maybe that's the wrong word to use, but uh, you well, know, these I, physical I, manifestations of this energy reacting with each other. Yeah, but I, I think you'd object to the, your formulation of the question, that I think that he would, part of his book, The Concept of Nature, is trying to show how this flux view of the world really ends up could end up you end up with objects in it so you know in those middle chapters all the work he's doing about convergence of events and um, uh, and the way in which those events would um, separate in time and space is an effort to show that you get objects out of this but you still have and it's consistent with um, our best knowledge of science is revealed in special relativity, and I think you know I haven't read any of the stuff he wrote after 
quantum mechanics, but my guess is he would say, as well as quantum mechanics, in fact, show us that this view of, of, of the universe is being constantly in flux is actually more true than the, uh, a basic deep materialist view, and that his work that he's doing in those middle chapters is to show that um, there is a, uh, you know, a deep philosophical preference for it as well. That, I see. And I would answer that question um, just by saying science doesn't need to be um, physicalist or realist. It just needs to be empirical. I think, you know, the, the, the whole thing. If you stick with the empirical and your, and your theories actually operate on what's, you know, knowable, observable, phenomenal reality, you're still doing science. It's, the theories can come and go, you know, as Thomas Kuhn said, but what, what makes it real, I think, what the real world is for a pro process philosopher is just experience as such. And then everything that we say about it is always going to have a sort of secondary status. That might come and go. You know, the Earth isn't flat anymore. Uh, you know, Earth isn't at the center anymore, etc. But if you ask scientists, I don't think they would be satisfied with saying the goal of science is to arrive at that secondary relegated status. I think they'd say that they're going for that primary status, and they just aren't there yet. Well, of course, of course they are. And so that I mean that's so there's this sort of wonderful dual, dual conceit in science. On the one hand, you are, every time you're trying to, uh, you're trying to understand the world, you're trying to make it as a broadly applicable as possible. And you're trying to um, uh, account for something that, uh, that has a, a permanence that anybody can come and look at the same thing you did and come up with the same conclusion. Um, as, as you did. So that's the one hand. You're searching for the eternal and the, um, the lo most long-lasting account you possibly can. On the other hand, you, because you're empirical and because you're looking at it, you're willing to revise it given uh, your constant trying to figure it out. So on the one hand, you're shooting to figure it out. On the other hand, you realize that you're actually in the act of figuring it out all the time. And that's just, to me, just the characteristic of, one of the characteristics of science is you, is you hold them, bo both those things are true as part of your inquiry. All right. You're, you're, shoot, you're, you're shooting for the, the, the biggest one, but you constantly acknowledge that you might be wrong or you might have to revise. Go, so I'm one sorry, other, David. No, I'm sorry, go ahead, David. Um, now I, I lost my thought. Please go ahead. So, one other quality of science is to have experiments that are falsifiable. And I wonder if Whitehead's metaphysics is actually something that can be deemed falsifiable. This is the way that I see philosophy in modern times. I mean, aside from the other myriad of uh, useful ways that it presents itself, I see it as the the engine of scientific hypothesis. It, philosophers like it. it okay. Maybe I should start here. It takes a completely different type of person to be a good scientist than it does to be, be a good hypothesizer to come up with new, creative, outside-of-the-box ways of looking at reality. For example, uh, to, to be a good scientist, you need to be extremely unbiased. Uh, you, you need to be very good at... You, you need to be very detail-oriented, exacting. You need to conduct experiments in a way that uh, takes a falsifiable hypothesis and the only outcome could be that it proves your hypothesis incorrect or correct. Now, that's one set of skills, and the other set of skills is somebody that thinks in terms of, you know, crazy outside-of-the-box theories that that, hypo that that scientist then creates a falsifiable hypothesis in correspondence with, and then tests those hypotheses. Now, that sounds like a needlessly complicated way of saying it, but I, I guess I'm just wondering, is Whitehead's metaphysics something that can be falsifiable in an experiment setting? And in that way, is it useless to science? Is that, yeah, I think most people use the word metaphysics in a kind of, uh, or at least a lot of people, in a kind of derogatory sense. It's, it's by definition claims being made about the numinal realm, which is by definition something we could never know. It's the, the part of the world that causes experience, and so it's sort of behind or beneath or beyond experience. 
in some sense. So it can only ever be speculation about what you know the things in themselves actually are. My favorite guys say, you know, we just shouldn't even be talking about them. We don't, human beings don't have any business talking about you know, realms of reality to which we have no access. Tell that to Dylan, who makes his living doing it. Dylan, does that make you mad that he said that? I I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> you, you mean about the idea of doing physics and studying things that are smaller than our everyday experience? Is that what you mean? No, no, those are still going to be at least... Um, I guess I was thinking what Stephen meant, because what you said didn't oh. sound very objectionable. No, I was just kidding. I was just trying to create conflict. That's what makes uh, the show okay. interesting. When uh, Mark goes back and listens to this episode and decides whether to continue with these, he's going to want some drama. That's okay. what I'm trying to bring to the table. Okay. Let's step outside right now and settle this. What do you say? <laughs> How's that? What is your ethnic background, David? Maybe you and Dylan have some sort of hostility there, like two tribes that were warring in the past. You guys can argue about that. Yeah, no? I'm a Celtic mutt. You know, I'd be willing, wearing, willing to wear a kilt. Okay, are you Germanic, there. Dylan? Shout. Germanic no, tribe? No, no, I'm, I'm also mainly, mainly uh, Celtic. So. Those Celts think they're a lot better than Germans. Maybe there's somebody that. Let's see. No. So, um, I. I I'm not sure what uh, when I when I read concept of nature and think about the you know w what's Whitehead's point, um, especially given that uh, you know to put your question another way, Stephen would be, what's the empirical evidence for the metaphysics that he has? How how or, you know how is it falsifiable? How you know? How are we going to um, decide whether or not it's worth our while? And I think that uh, in reading the concept of nature, I felt like Whitehead wanted to uh, say that thinking about the world in this way is a more in line with what we know about the world based upon our best science. And he would point to something like special relativity for that and that it is a more rich and interesting world um, that we can uh, develop more science out of and uh, in that way it's it's more true so I think all of those things sort of fold in together and I, you know, I don't know that you know he called it I didn't see anything in the book that called he called it again called it pragmatism, but he seems to be very very much in the same boat as uh, as those guys. What was that? That line um, showed up in the um, podcast you guys did, where uh, a thing is just all the effects it can have. In yeah. Relations with other things. That's Purse. That's yep. straight out of Charles Purse, the yep. uh, founder of pragmatism. Yep. And, and James and Dewey are very similar in that respect. Yep. It's just the effects. When you actually um, put an idea or a theory into practice, what are the effects? And, you know, that means something real particular in the physics lab, but you, you can apply that to just sort of any idea. The truth of any idea is how does it work out when you... Well, I'm not telling you anything you already know. But how does it work out when you actually put it into practice? So, David... Yeah. Uh, this is something that I was wondering when you talked earlier about, you know, you, you fancy yourself a connoisseur of process philosophers. I, I'm wondering how you see Whitehead in relation to all those other people. Do you have any insights that you can bring when it comes to process philosophy in particular while reading the concept of nature? Uh, well, there's, there's a, sort of the secular versions of process philosophy and theological versions, and Whitehead is going to end up in that Ladder camp. He's going to be real big at the divinity schools and stuff like that. Hey. Uh, whereas James and Persig are not so much. Yeah. So David, actually, this is it, I. I know very. I read that about um, Whitehead, and I've I guess I've heard a little bit about it. But given your own background and study, could you sort of just tell me a little bit about you know theological process philosophy versus other kinds of process philosophy and sort of what's on the you know, 
What's on the I guess I don't the, really know. The, 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 the differences between them? I, I guess I'm totally guessing here that Whitehead is going to say something like that the, the ultimate engine behind all the processes um, or all the processes together are God. You know, it's it's uh, an agency of some kind in the universe. Whereas with um, people like uh, James and Persig, the pragmatist, it's going to be a more like a humanism, where we're just we're just sort of practicing a little epistemic humility, staying within the bounds of what's knowable by human beings. You know, not just like a sol in a solipsistic way, but what can be knowable, what's might be around the corner, you know, we haven't seen it yet, but it's within the realm of possibility, that sort of thing. And they just, they don't want to, they, they, they both flirt with religious ideas, but they both insist that you just can't say what that is, what God is. As soon as you start talking, you know, now you're turning it into something really, you, a mystic does not say anything about God. Just shut up, like Wittgenstein or something. You know, you if it's a if it's the ineffable, well, just write a poem or something. Yeah. So so I guess you can. I mean, when you start going, start talking metaphysics, start trying to talk about what the world is like and you know what it is and what the nature of us as beings are and what entities are. It's you know, it's a pretty straight path to end up start starting to. You know, run up against theological discussions. It's, it's you know, it's gonna. It's easy to see how that happens. So I, got, I didn't read anything or any secondary works about Whitehead in terms of you know what it means in for theological process philosophy. But it's a, it's a little bit going to be a little bit like Hegel, where you know the unfolding of everything is the absolute is everything is sort of taking place within the absolute, something like that. His, you know, stuff is also heavily theological. It's all very cryptic. And James was just a, you know, he spent a lifetime debating this stuff with uh, British idealists. He did not like Hegel. He said he wanted the scalp of the absolute. So his, James is sort of inventing a system to, to take down that kind of idealism, yeah. and 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 Persig doesn't like it either because it's too, you know, through and through logical. I mean, Hegel, he didn't he didn't like that all-encompassing thing. Both of these guys are, you know, it's pluralistic, it's all provisional, it's an evolutionary process going on here, and our truths are evolving as well. Nothing is going to stand still. Everything is in motion all the time, and you know. They, the, the, the meaning and truth of things doesn't change so much that you can't get through a sentence before you know there's a new truth, but it's you know open to change. Yeah. So certainly in the the book we read for the podcast, um, we didn't get any of any of that issue in Whitehead. Um, I can I can see where you end up, where you could get a get down that theological road. Um, this one was more about how to understand science, understand the world in a way that's consistent with, you know, the then contemporary best understandings of science, and also root that, you know, take a stab at how that how that underlying metaphysics of science that was prior to special relativity ought to change to make it more consistent with that and more consistent going forward. So, um, Dylan, can I just say something real quick? I know this is not of course you can. exactly relevant, but uh, you have beautiful skin. Do you have a, I've been interested in like a skincare routine lately. and I My think, skin? I, yeah, I think because we both come from a European descent, my, I, you must... Uh, you must empathize with me that it's not always easy to take care of your skin. It's it's obvious that you've lived a lifetime of of, of testing out skincare products and washing your face and just doing things that. I, I, you're a beautiful person. Not saying that in any kind of weird sense. I, I'm wondering what you do so that I can look like you. Uh, I, I think my hairline is just receding, so you just see more of my skin as my <laughs> forehead is getting bigger and bigger, and. Uh, 
Uh, I don't do anything special. Steve. I am. Um, uh, well, I'm morbidly obese, so I, you see a lot of skin whenever you look at me, and it doesn't look as good as your skin. So obviously, more is not necessarily better. So you you have no like there, there's no lemon and brown sugar regimen you have going. There's no like uh, you know extracts <laughs> that you put on your face on a daily basis to maintain that. I I use I use the fat of the slaughtered calf. How dare you <laughs> bring that up? It's it's like no. Okay, and they're laughing I, at me. I couldn't resist, even I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Nobody watching this knows why I'm reacting this way because before the broadcast started, I'm gonna give you guys a peek behind the curtain. I had a heated discussion with Dylan. It, it wasn't actually heated. I just I love to pick people's brains that are smarter than me, and I wanted to know why he thinks it's morally justifiable to eat meat. And so we had this long discussion where I played devil's advocate of the people that say you should never kill an animal, and you know how can you even justify killing an animal in self-defense? And now this this cruel <laughs> vixen tells me that he rubs the, the fat of a slaughtered calf. He knows the only way that I can get skin like his is if I throw out everything I think I know about the universe. Yeah, he's okay. a uh, satanic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I was bored by a bull once. So for me. Hamburgers are all about revenge. <laughs> Vengeance. Vengeance killing. Because we all know that's always justifiable, right? Killing things out of out of vengeance. Like if that kid walking down the street with the beautiful calves punches me in the dick, that means I can kill him. I, anyway, I know that wasn't actually an argument. Anyway, yeah. dude, what Sorry. are we going to... I feel like my questions are monopolizing this entire conversation. Is that a wrong... A uh, distinction to make. Well, uh, no, I think I think we've been trying to you know just talk through a little bit more about you know what Whitehead was talking about, and we ran into similar challenges on the podcast of trying to um, get into the nitty gritty on the one hand of because he's he's very particular when he runs when he's talking and uh, writing in the concept of nature. And getting a sense of his overall big project without being completely loosey goosey, and it was a little bit of a challenge. And I think that's David was saying earlier that he finds that he just doesn't understand what Whitehead is saying sometimes. And I think it's partly because, I mean, the, the extent that he's challenging to read is he goes back and forth between these really particular ways of speaking, you know, doing these mathematical derivations, and then jumps out really big and it's hard for it not to feel very loosey-goosey and and losing the thread of um, the particulars and how he gets to the bigger picture. Um, for me, it, it wasn't so hard to see because I felt like he, on the one hand, wanted to grant all of, all of sort of, let's just call it Newtonian science, pre-special relativity, pre- quantum mechanics as being just a perfectly reasonable way to to write down an account of the world. What he objected to were a particular strain of metaphysical underpinnings that would uh, be a way of talking about that Newtonian science. So uh, he, again, he wants to, in the concept of nature, show how you can get those particularities, those entities, those objects out of a flux-oriented universe. So you don't need to, you know, and to avoid the, the fallacy of misplaced con concreteness. So just because you think in terms of objects, because your mathematical equations are in terms of, of uh, entities that have a boundary and forces and so forth, doesn't mean that, um, oh, that's all there is. You know, that's the yeah, and you the take way. a pragmatic view, maybe, and you say, you yeah. know, these are convenient, they work, they function in the equations, this is the best truth we have right now. So you sort of take an ironic stance toward your scientific posits, maybe. Yes, and I guess in thinking about that ironicness or the provisionality, you have to toss in there that uh, they... I want to use the word correspond, but correspond is has, is such a loaded word. Philosophically. It just agrees right. with experience. It agrees with experience, and this is where the empiricism, David, I think that you were bringing up, is that you're going to go and do a measurement. You're going to go look at the world, and it, it could be a measurement in a fancy way, like I'm going to go 
you know, and set up an inclined plane and get out my stopwatch, you know, and do a measurement. Or it could be I look out the window and I see stuff happening <laughs> and I try to figure out what's going on. It, it could be any of either of those extremes. Um, but you're going to judge whether or not you're right in your figuring things out based upon whether it agrees with that experience. And you're going to change what you think about how things are going on based upon that agreement and disagreement. And so there is, it's sensible to say, well, I figure out how the car runs. or And, be, and in order for, the, for me to get the car to work or me to get the plants to grow, there are things I need to do that need to happen in order for those plants to grow. And, and, in, and you know, the fact that my plants, you know, my corn is, you know, eight feet high and I get, you know, three or four ears of corn per plant and my neighbor has a field of dead corn means that one of us is doing something different. <laughs> and, and one of us has figured it out and one of us hasn't. That's what, that, you know, and... How the the collider is kind of a you know a real particular version of just seeing what happens when you test your theory, right? Yeah, and, try, and trying to and trying to figure things out. Yes. So at some point, your theory has to make contact with empirical reality. Otherwise, it just sort of remains a, a, a theory. You're not gonna, and that's what you shouldn't believe too much in, right? The aren't the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness yes is when you're putting the theoretical posits over the empirical reality from which they are abstracted in the first place but that's what i think i think science can just be considered a collection of fallacies of misplaced concreteness in that in that case i mean the, the limits of empiricism will always preclude you from arriving at what nature actually is versus how our minds perceive the world. I know I already brought this up, and I know it's supposedly explained in the middle chapters, which I didn't understand at all. Well, very little of it I understood. I just don't understand how... I mean, he, he so clearly makes the distinction that we should uh, differentiate between how our minds perceive the world in that flawed way and start studying the nature that underlies all of that, whatever that thing is that underlies our experience. And... All, it, I, I don't understand how science is even a useful process. I, I, I get that we can use it pragmatically and it can be used. I, I guess that's how it's useful. It's useful for humans. It's just not necessarily arriving at what actuality is, right? As Persig says, is that, you know, the, these things aren't true so much as they're convenient. You know, they're, there's always going to be a human purpose and interest involved in these things, and it's kind of a mistake, he thinks, to pretend that it's not, that, you know, in that sense, objectivity is kind of a... Well, the goal of science is not notion. I, I, I'm sorry for interrupting. I was just saying, because I feel like I'm beating a dead horse and I feel like I'm not understanding something, like I'm uh, about 30 IQ points dumber than everybody else that's read this. I, I don't understand, like, science is not in the business of arriving at pragmatic, convenient conclusions that we can base our thinking on and then hopefully arrive at a, a, a limitation of human suffering. I don't know how you use science in the world practically, but it, it, it's in the business, at least ostensibly, of arriving at the truth, right? At what that nature is actually. Or is it well, only about connections? Well, I think you have to be a little bit, yeah, uh, but it's also in the business of understanding that that's a constantly revising uh, endeavor. Yeah. So, I guess it just goes back to the, you know, to earlier comments that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah, you can do science and act like a realist and suppose realism is true for the sake of writing papers and all that, but then, you know, maybe on the weekends you're a philosopher of science where you're saying, well, you know, these aren't really uh, all they're cracked up to be, and this is probably going to be defeated at some point in the future, so I'm not going to I'm not going to make any claims about what ultimate reality is, but this is our best approximation right now. Yeah, you can't you can't do that at the end of every sentence when you're just practicing science because that's just going to be too you know, cumbersome. So there's sort of it, sort of two different 
programs there where, where you're just sort of working within the paradigm and producing data and not asking a lot of big questions. But then there's also where you get philosophical about what's really going on with the assumptions behind all this science. And isn't that what isn't that what Whitehead is doing as a kind of philosophy of science? Here? I think he think I me. Mean, I think he's self-consciously thinking of that when he's in the concept of nature. He wants us to think differently about what we're doing in science um, as a way to in, uh, continue to enliven it. I mean, he, yeah. I mean, a whole bunch of the concept of nature is not trying to quote unquote do new science, but to make a uh, make his metaphysical account of the world to show that it's consistent with um, the current view of science. I mean, the current view, you know, consistent, consistent with current science so that you could get special relativity and general relativity and other things out of it. You can get objects and entities out of his, uh, his understanding. So. Do you think it'd be safe to say that you have to speak the language of mathematics to really comprehend what he's trying to work out in detail there? Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I think for what he's trying to do in concept of nature, um, I think evaluating what he's doing, like trying to say, well, because he's doing a lot of mathematical gymnastics not super sophisticated, but he's definitely doing some in the middle about, and I think to criticize it in terms of the derivation, you would need to understand the mathematics. But to understand the basic idea of what he's doing, um, where you're not trying to evaluate his mathematical derivation, I don't think that's so hard to, so hard to get. Um, whether he helps you get that or not, it's not clear to me. Uh, I, he's definitely just you know, he's a mathematician, and he just thinks in this way all the time. It's 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 uh, you know in his bones and in his in in his brain. And so thinking about convergent series as a way of explaining his uh, his idea about uh, turning processes and flux into objects is perfectly natural and sensible to him. And, uh, is he and trying to solve a, Say again? Is he tr trying to solve a problem that appeared in his mathematical work? Uh, I, I don't know. That might be... That, uh, hmm. Maybe in the Principia. Right. I mean, I that, know, that's yeah. a really epic thing, right? Something yeah. must have come up there. Even metaphysically. Uh, even metaphysical questions might be raised by something that ambitious, right? I mean, I, I have known nothing about it, but well, it's you, a huge deal, right? Yeah, you might understand you know, a lot of Russell's later work as trying to sort out problems that came up in the Principia. And maybe Russ, maybe Whitehead's similar to that. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know for sure. It's very, it's very interesting that you draw, you, uh, Dylan, you drew the distinction between the metaphysics we do and the sort of the philosophy of science stuff and the day-to-day -day experimental stuff, but surely from time to time they overlap, right? Like when, when you think about experiments you're going to do and what experiments you're going to conduct, you presumably have some kind of ontology, right? Of I mean, course. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you'd think, you'd think there would be some overlap there. Yeah, and I don't think that Whitehead necessarily would disagree. You know, um, in some ways that ontology would point you to what kinds of things you would be looking for. And so that that part, I think, that Whitehead is one of the reasons why Whitehead is so keen in the concept of nature to show that you can get the normal everyday world of science and objects out of his... Um, out of his uh, uh, flux thinking, but also to him it opens up a world to looking at looking for new kinds of things and new new motions and actions in the world, and so therefore it's to the end of how, having science a continue to flourish and b um, uh, find even more interesting kinds of things in the world. Mm. It's interesting that you that the Whitehead made the connection to special and general relativity. When I was reading about 
whiteheads talk about what we think as objects as being abstractions, and you know a lot of people compare them to William James in that sense. You know, being not not a logical positivist, but some kind of radical empiricist in the sense that what we see in the world around us is constructed in some sense, right? So when we see objects, they're actually what we act, the sense data underlying what we call objects is actually you know more complicated than the way we simplify it in ordinary perception. That kind of reminded me a bit of Heisenberg in 1925 talking about how, you know, or the Copenhagen interpretation talking about how electrons, you know, the way we think, the, they're, they're in, you think matrix mechanics, I believe it's called, and what you, you, don't, you don't think about electrons as particles anymore, they're just, you know, this, this set of data which you can make into matrices and stuff like that, and just the, I mean, I, I remember that Heisenberg himself was influenced by Ernst Mach and the, and, you know, the Austrian logical positivist people, and, you know, it's kind of radical empiricism, right? And if you actually go down to what looks like the data, you, you emerge with a whole new picture. I wonder if there's something different, uh, something similar going on in Whitehead. Well, I definitely came away wondering what Whitehead thought about quantum mechanics. I mean, the book we read is just a little bit before. It's kind of in that gap between mm. um, general relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, and I, 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 you know, I confess I haven't followed my nose on that to read, <laughs> read stuff from him, you know, because he certainly was alive for a lot longer and, and surely wrote stuff about it. Um, the thing, more than Heisenberg and uh, matri matrix mechanics and even empiricism, logical empiricism, I th thought about quantum field theory and... Uh, you know that all that you know every every entity you know that the world the universe is made up of fields that are um, interfering with one another and that an electron really is a resonance in a field and every every object is a um, resonant motion um, and that all material is different kinds of resonant motions um, that to me would you know I felt like Whitehead would just Say yes, of course. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, in terms of physical theory, there's also a kind of Spinozistic kind of monism, right? When he talks about nature, you don't talk about a single thing having an effect on another thing. You talk about nature's parts having effects on each other. That felt yeah. uh, reminded me a bit of substance monism. Sure, sure. And maybe that's where the you know part of the theological end that we talk. I don't know if you uh, were on early earlier. You, uh, how do you how do you pronounce your name? Amog. 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 Welcome, welcome to the conversation. Um, the uh, we were talked a little bit earlier. Um, David. Hello. David was um, uh, you know, filling us in a little bit about what the difference maybe between you know theological process philosophy that kind of end and sort of a more mm -hmm. humanistic end of it sort of something. And that we had noted on the podcast that Whitehead has a, a whole bunch of there are a whole bunch of people who who have paid attention to Whitehead based upon um, the theological process philosophy stuff. Um, well, if we I, I forgot where I was going with this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me rescue you. Here's a life preserver. Uh, if so, if we're thinking about Whitehead in terms of substance monism, like yeah, Spinoza. Yeah. What are the ethical implications of that? Did Whitehead write a doctrine of ethics? I don't know if he did. It, it seems like when we're differentiating between a humanist process philosophy and a theological, a, a lot of the differences between those are going to be the ethical implications of process philosophy, right? Or is that an oversimplification? Well, I mean, even if you think, before you think about the ethics, right, I mean, if, if you're thinking about Spinoza and monism, all, you, you begin to think of all sorts of wacky positions that Whitehead could go, Whitehead could take from here, like, first of all, is he a determinist, if he's this, if he's this kind of, if he's a monist, right, and all, all of these other questions. Why is that wacky to be a determinist? Well, it's not, it's not wacky to be a determinist, it's, a, it's quite, it's not an unpopular position. But, I feel attacked. Uh, but, but, but an, ex an example, that, an example where it becomes start, starts sounding kind of wacky is the way you you know Leibnizian um, mon monism, and where, and this I think might have something in common with Whitehead, where everything in the world is you know 
is a reflection of the entire universe. So any particular entity is also a reflection of all the actions of the universe. And, um, and that um, there is one, you know, one, one world, <laughs> right? That, and there are also all these individual monads. Yeah. And they are sort of all... But that's where it becomes wacky, right? I mean, it, it becomes yeah. like a crazy theory when you start talking about the infinite points of light that comprise everything. I mean, that, that's what makes it crazy. Not the idea that's of it being crazy. deterministic or a, being a substance monist, right? No, none of those are crazy. Maybe I'm getting defensive. Is this me? I, I'm showing my hand here. All right, no, I'm not a determinist. I am not a substance monist. I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Can I chime in and say it's what James James is doing, William James, it, it's it's definitely a kind of a monism, but it's ex, an experiential monism rather than a substance monism. I suppose Whitehead is going to be okay with that because he's going coming out against substance. But within the monism, everything exists in relation to everything else, just like you hear Whitehead saying. And so they call it relationism as well as a process philosophy. Yeah. And, and William James will say something also very similar to Whitehead. That the terms related are not more important or more real than the relation between them. So you, you can you can get to this relationism if you stop thinking of things as entities, one entity over here and one entity over here, and they're somehow related. No, that relation is part of the reality too. The thing that connects them, and then everything is connected in all kinds of levels of relations. It's so complicated. When yeah. you pick one relation, we're really abstracting that from a, a much more complex and rich whole. We're leaving a whole lot of it out, so we can grasp that one part. Well, that's yeah, David, I'm really glad you brought that up because that exact formulation of being cons of trying to have us focus on the relations rather than the relata and that right. the relations are have the same status as the relata mm -hmm. is I mean, he, Whitehead straight up uses that language throughout the concept of nature. Um, particularly in the first third, first half of it and um, and yes absolutely and that, that those relations are equally real it's not just um, have equal status and there's and that the, the you know sort of one of the fallacies is to um, focus on the relata of a relation and say that those are the real things as opposed to um, the relation itself in some ways, you know, I, I, you get a glimpse. To me, I got a glimpse of the kind, the point that Whitehead was trying to make in th just thinking about speed or velocity, where you know, in um, uh, you know, normally you would think of it as you know, space and time being the real things, and the speed is just a relationship between them that uh, that. You know, is the result of uh, you know a kind of limit limiting behavior of how s um, space and time are related, but I think for for Whitehead the speed the motion is the real thing, <laughs> and and <laughs> it and the 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 space and the time are concepts that we use to make sense of motion, but they they are I mean, in the concept of nature he's you know it's explicit that. Um, space and time are derivative notions that come out of a more primary notion of just motion in general, of speed. It's kind of like the, he's like the anti-Zeno. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. exactly. He, he might remind me a bit of Heraclitus, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. And, and, and even though he comes out against uh, Aristotle so much, you know, just because he he's pointing to Aristotelian materialism and the tradition of that, I would say that he has a lot. There's a lot in common with Aristotle in terms of the, the idea that motion is a primary um, a primary entity. Uh, that's all through Aristotle's physics and and especially in his biology and the sort of uh, the development of organisms. 
Um, now, you know, there's some differences there. It's not for Aristotle. It, it is true that it doesn't seem to be all merely flux, right? Things have have ends in a way that um, might not be quite consistent with what um, Heraclitus is always talking about. But he definitely sounds like Heraclitus. It's interesting when you talk about substance monism. I mean, I've been reading a bit more of Newton recently, and so and, you know, there was this bit of controversy about whether absolute space or absolute time in the oh, yeah. sense was actually Spinozistic monism. I wonder if you could know, compare the two. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the details of Newtonian physics, but you know, it's this. The subs, it certainly seems similar in in terms of having this having this absolute underlying sub absolute, uh, absolute underlying ground for all motion in terms of absolute space and then similarly in the case of duration for absolute time seems to be kind of like substance monism so I, I this is where I you know reveal the fact that I don't really I'm not a uh, I'm not a philosophy expert <laughs> because I don't I don't I don't really uh, I have to ask for an explanation of uh, substance monism, so I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm looking it up, and I have an you know because I've read uh, Leibniz, I have an idea about what it is, but um, uh, and why. I mean, the explanation I'm thinking of for substance monism is mainly Spinozistic in terms of there being only one underlying substance and everything else is an attribute of that substance and therefore okay. everything else is causal, etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yeah, fair, I, I mean, fair enough. Okay. Uh, I was going to clarify. Spinoza was replying to Descartes. He was another one of the continental rationalists when he made that claim, and Descartes before him believed that there were you know, multiple substances, mind, matter, and God. And so what Spinoza says is that there's no reason to extrapolate and, uh, and to infer that there are other substances other than one, the totality of all existence, which we are all aspects of, one substance. Yeah, so it's yeah. Par yeah. Parmenides versus Heraclitus all over again, right? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got it now. Down she goes. Um, uh, the, uh, the absolute space... Stuff in um, in Newton. It's an interesting. He has a in uh, the um, in that Principia as opposed to Whitehead's Principia. Um, he has a a long section talking about um, uh, absolute space and the possibility of it because part of his theory um, doesn't require it and 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 it's. Uh, because of the relativity of motion, and yet there's this problem that when you talk about, you know, the motions being relative, like, well, they're relative to what? And it's a pretty quick set of steps, and you're asking, well, what is the container of the universe? Like, what's holding it all? Right. And and that's where the absolute space conversation comes up, like, you know, uh, and he has this this experiment that he has about a bucket, a spinning bucket. Where, by ba basically looking at the way the water is behaving in a spinning bucket, he has an argument that that shows you that there's absolute space. Um, when you sit there and look at it, I don't. I, it's not completely convincing. <laughs> no way. <laughs> you mean you can't? Hold on. Wait a second. You, mean you can't understand the fundamental nature of the universe by looking at it spinning water in a bucket. I never would have thought no, that. Uh, I'm sorry to be honest. The absolute nature of space. Not you don't have to understand everything, Stephen. Just the absolute nature of space. Okay. Well, I feel like we're we're kind of speaking on behalf of Newton here. I, I guess we're kind of just theory crafting about. You're moving on Newton thought. So yeah, yeah, fair enough. When I look into a bucket, it's usually because my head is spinning. <laughs> <laughs> look at this guy. David, out of nowhere with the joke. Will you hold my hair? It's actually opposite. It's actually, it's actually, it's actually relevant. <laughs> no, wait, wait, the, the Newton, I was going to say, the Newtonian um, model is the kind of thing that's all going to happen in a, you know, real commonsensical Euclidean space, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe this is a kind of a question for Dylan or anybody who fills up with answering. Isn't one of the things that Whitehead is doing is he's trying to deal with alternative models about what space is, right? There aren't there alternative geometries 
sure. uh, being invented about that this time to to work with Einstein's theories rather than the Newtonian, Euclidean. Well, the the, the geometries were were developed earlier, but it's certainly true that. Um, in both the special theory and in the general theory, uh, those geometries end up getting leveraged for the physical world, which in some ways makes them all the more interesting that um, they, they rise from being sort of mathematical, mathematical entities to having some bearing on the real world, which yeah, just makes them all the more interesting. So. It becomes a property of the physical universe rather than the stage in which physical properties act out. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, could you unpack that a bit more? I didn't I didn't really understand what you meant. Which you? Um that was, uh, both well you guys were discussing sort of <laughs> the same topic, so either. So uh I took David as asking the question that um, that or, or just wondering out loud whether Whitehead was um, in part reacting to there being multiple geometries in the right. world uh, as opposed to a Newtonian world which was primarily Euclidean and so mm -hmm. uh, uh, the problem of there being multiple ways of talking about geometrical a geometric universe wasn't a problem because it was perfectly consistently Euclidean and that once you had multiple geometries mathematically, this would be one way of saying the story, once you realize that Euclidean geometry isn't the only kind of geometry, doesn't that raise the question about which kind of geometry the universe has? Mm -hmm. If it's a Euclidean geometry or is it some other kind of geometry? Right. And, and, uh, and in, indeed um, both, you know, in special relativity and in general relativity, you have um, specific instances of kinds of, excuse me, kinds of geometry that aren't Euclidean. Right. And uh, so there's an, an, an interesting, an interesting sort of history of ideas question going on there about how, you know, those intellectual inquiries fed on one another, and I don't know, you know. Uh, surely, you know, it's 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 absolutely certain that Whitehead was very conscious of of this crisis in mathematics in the late 1800s and the discussion of of the refounding of mathematics. In fact, he was part of that in terms of writing in Principia, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that you know, in some ways, that Principia can be understood as a way to try to sort out the various conflicts in mathematics. That uh, were, you know, happened as a re as a result of you know discovering new geometries, discovering you know thinking of new ways, uh, you know, seeing inconsistencies in the way we accounted for numbers and, um, and so forth. I have a kind of very blunt question to Dylan: Is do we live in a Euclidean universe? Hmm. Well, I need to know that before I can go out and buy groceries. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it depends upon the the thing that you want to do. So, if you're going to go out and buy groceries, you, the Euclidean w universe works just fine. In fact, if you're trying to fire off a satellite, actually, it works pretty well. But if you're going to talk about other things, the Euclidean universe doesn't quite rise up to the to the you know ri rise up to the occasion. So this is kind of the same distinction he's making when it comes to his entire uh, metaphysics, is that the modern science during his time shores up well with the substance attribute view of the world, but ultimately he's trying to present a different one that also shores up well with it, and he's just showing that it's very easy to have a confirmation bias and to assume that the substance attribute uh, worldview is the, the end-all, be-all way of looking at things, but ultimately it may not be, just in the same way he's doing with Euclidean geometry versus these other forms that are arising, right? Or is that a? No, I I I think that's right. I think that that he wants to wants to preserve all the all the ways of talking about the world that have been so successful in science, and show that his account is consistent with that. Um, 
but that it amounts to a different way of looking at the world. Um, it, you know, this I don't know. I haven't thought enough about Whitehead to see if it's um, has the same power of fruitfulness. But you know, there are examples of this distinction that we live with all the time, at least in physics. The obvious one to me is force thinking versus energy thinking, and you know, when you if you go and learn, uh, you know, typically you know it gets called Newtonian mechanics or whatever, and you start talking about force and F equals m a, and you do force calculations to try to see, you know, how f how fast is the weight going to fall to the ground if it's hooked up to these 12 pulleys with this weight being dragged across this you know the surface of this inclined plane with this angle and so forth, and you end up to, you can do a force calculation on that. Um, and then there's another way of thinking about it in terms of of giving and taking of kinetic and potential energy and transformations of one kind of energy into another. And uh, and if you go and do those accounts, uh, you'll find that you know at the end the mathematical description of the motion of the objects is going to be the same. You'll come up with the same numbers. And in fact, it's a very famous. Um, Correspondence, you know, shown between Newtonian mechanics and, you know, something like Lagrangian mechanics, which is action or motion-based. And, uh, but I would submit that the ways of looking at those entities and those objects and thinking about how the world works is very different in those two cases. And in physics, you just go back and forth between them. You sort of use them, you know, at one. You know, you know, equally fastly. And some people make the argument that, well, the energy one is just much more useful. And you know, yeah, you might think about the force one, but that really thinking about it in terms of force really amounts to sort of doing Earth-centered astronomy. It's useful for sailing, but it's yeah. not really the way the world works, and it's not nearly as flexible as as uh, thinking about um, you know, you know, non-Earth-based astronomy. Is is that the relata relation distinction? Maybe energy is, does energy relate more to the relata and force to the relations, or maybe the maybe the reverse? Oh, that might be right, actually. It's, force is maybe between. Which I'm, I don't have a sophisticated understanding of these things, but energy seems to me to be talking about objects, while force seems to be talking about relations. It it it, it does, but of course you then have this. You then talk about the force itself, and you, you know, you end up to write your your equation, you know, Newton's second second law, of the force equals the change in momentum, uh, or you know, or typically the mass times the acceleration, is um, leaves you with asking, well, where is the force? <laughs> like, where where, where where is it sitting? Um, right. Uh, whereas the energy is something that is characteristic of the individual parts, but also the system as a whole. So the whole system has an energy, and that gets divvied up. And this is where you know you get the monism, right? You mm -hmm. you you have you have a conservate energy ends up being the catch-all term for it's the thing that is conserved. That you don't get any right. more, any less of. That that allows you to speak of the whole system. It's your lever into the whole, so that you can have any kind of rationality, right? That that is that you can have a ratio between that whole and anything else. That's that's where you end up with the energy. So Dylan, uh, you're a celebrity physicist, and you do I, work every single day uh, <laughs> in that field. You're a good friend of Carl Sagan, as we know. You. No, I, yeah, I speak with the dead as well. So. A pioneer of string theory. Now I'm wondering, if Alfred North Whitehead's metaphysics end up being true, let's just pretend, let's have a hypothetical universe here, where they end up being absolutely true, does that change your job in any real way at all? In fact, I'm not even sure what you do. I read on the website you do radiation therapy. <laughs> I, I, um, I work as a physicist uh, uh, working on radiation therapy devices, yeah. Um, uh, does so you're asking the brass tax question? Does Whitehead's 
metaphysics, does his philosophy of science make a difference for how you do science? Yes, practically speaking, yeah. somebody that's a, you know, a, a pillar of the physics world like you, is your job affected by Whitehead's you know, worldview if it ends up being true? I thought this would be the easiest question to answer. <laughs> no, I, I guess I'm just trying to think about, um, you know, where do, if we go back to the question, like I, I put brought up this example of velocity, and on the one hand, we talk about velocity as, you know, when you try to make a, a mathematically consistent account, of understanding it as a, uh, a velocity as a rate of change in space with respect to a, a, a change in space with respect to a change in time. And so um, uh, it ends up being in some ways a kind of ephemeral thing because something only has a instantaneous velocity. It's a weird thing to talk about instantaneous velocity. But we end up talking about something like speed or change as being an entity in itself, as a thing in itself. Uh, even if we end up trying to take that back. So that is, we talk about the relations as being entities, even if we uh, castigate ourselves later and want to only talk about the relata. I think we very naturally begin talking about relations as being entities. Um, and so if I were to try to say, you know, does thinking about things in terms that Whitehead's talking about, does it matter, or diff matter at all? I guess it would be that if, if I was stuck never thinking of relations as things, then it would be a kind of a, uh, it might make a difference to go looking at the world in terms of relations and trying to really um, play that out. One, one way in which it might make a difference also is you might take seriously the notion that the very laws of the universe are changing and that, mm -hmm. uh, and that might lead you down that road of taking seriously the idea that um, there's more interesting physics to be done just because the world itself may be changing in terms of your everyday laws. And not just the fact that the table has a kind of impermanence, but the laws themselves may have an impermanence to them. Yeah. Some, somebody posted on the blog, you know, pointing out uh, Lee Smolin, who's a physicist who goes down this road a bit, thinking about the idea that the laws of the universe may be evolving. And that's weird considering the fact, like, like you're flagship treatise on radiation therapy obviously is helping millions of people around the world and it's working so to consider these uh, potential these uh, p potential facets of the, the, the nature of reality being different and you'd have to consider those it wouldn't do you any good I guess it comes back to the pragmatism thing uh, I mean you... well, what you're trying to figure out right so you know it, it may maybe it's the case that the laws of the universe don't change very much on the scale of human uh, of, ah. of human life, right? Just like, True. you know, who we are is a, this gets back to the organism thinking. You know, human beings or any other, you know, uh, living organism as a species, you know, any instance of that organism isn't going to change much. Um, but over many, 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 many generations, what you think, you know, you can see the, the uh, evolution of that organism as uh, um, over time. And it makes you want to think of that organism as an entity, right? <laughs> and not just as a... Um, Collection of relationships. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. That is true. Just, yeah, very broadly speaking, it, it, it just seems a process view is going to loosen up the theories. Um, you're going to hold them a little, with a, you know, not so tight a grip. And it, it even introduces a kind of pluralism where, you know, you can look at the same phenomenon from a scientific point of view, from a human point of view, and 
they don't cancel each other out. It's not that one is more correct than the other, but maybe one is more appropriate for the purpose that you're interested in at that point. You know, there's a, there's always going to be a, a reason why you would pick one valid view over another. You don't have to make just one valid view of the one and only universe. But now we, you know, it's a it's an unfolding process. There are many different perspectives, many different ways to take it. Is that it, yeah. it, it does, but in Dylan's line of work, it doesn't because human lives hang in the balance. He is a superhero. He, he, he can't just... Yeah, I'm sorry. Fell flat. Amo, Amo, <laughs> sure. what, what sure. did you want to say? Pretend like I never even said that. All right. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about... I mean, ontology does seem, does seem very... It's, I mean, for me, personally, I think it's, it's you know... It's the it's the one one bit of metaphysics that rules them all because it's you you can if you look at the influence Whitehead has in political philosophy and the people like Deleuze and all that stuff and the stuff you can build out of this particular process view right I mean it's pretty amazing and if you I mean I'm it is it does seem like Parmenides and Heraclitus all over again when you talk yeah. about them. I wonder how if if someone could you know adopt a you know modern sort of Dawkinsian reductionist position and sort of argue that you know Whitehead is talking out of his uh, rear end you know well what would what would a reductionist say to Whitehead that's hard to imagine yeah none, none I would say I mean the, the, the appeal to verifiability is easily I mean you can you can say you know, where do these events come from? And but then you know, he could talk about physics and. Well, I think the argument would come down to it because of a, a sort of philosophy of science argument that the whatever it is you're trying to find is actually the way the world is, and that there is a there's a characteristic of the answer to that question that is not um, Whiteheadian. So you would you 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 would have an argument about the um, the status of the answer you would you would admit for admit of, mm -hmm. and I mean, along the lines of Einstein's denial of quantum mechanics in the EPR paper, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that it's it's not that you know he doesn't recognize the consistency and power of the quantum mechanical argument. You know Schrodinger's equation and so forth. It's just that the as an answer to the question, it doesn't satisfy the criteria that he would put forth on it. Right. Um, and and so, and that's the kind of argument you'll get with with people you know denying Whitehead to say, look, it's just not it's just not the right the kind of answer that can possibly be the final answer because the you know they're disagreeing on the basis of the ontology. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, would that also go back to Parmenides and Heraclitus? I think. I mean, I think. I think it does in some ways. I mean, the. I mean, the really crass way of of talking about the distinction is, on the one hand, uh, Heraclitus is saying is pointing out that that change and change is manifest in the world. It's just. It's so clearly there. Mm -hmm. And and on the other hand, you have probably saying, but there can only be one world. <laughs> Otherwise, nothing is. It, it, it's it, it's uh, yes, there can only be one world. And the reason, and I think the reasons for that are pretty powerful because if if and it goes back to this question of the rationality of it, the fact that you can figure anything out means that the unity is there. Right. You know, there's evidence of that unity, that wholeness, because that wholeness gives you leverage onto the parts. Mm -hmm. That without that wholeness, then um, th there would be a kind of chaos that was completely unintelligible. You wouldn't even be able to have a conversation about it. Right. And so, and and they and someone like Parmenides is going to point to the notion that the world is constant flux as being a corollary for it being unintelligible. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, someone like Heraclitus is pointing to the manif you know, the manifest change in the world is going to be 
uh, saying that that uh, the the multiplicity and the transformations and the uh, the very interactions in the world mean that that has to be a primary feature of it. You can't oneness means a kind of staticness that does not admit of the manifest character of the world. I mean, one. I mean, on the face of it, what Parmenides said. I mean, I can disagree with that in terms of you know. If, if you think about, you know, the way we understand the world in, I mean, I'm pulling this out of Nietzsche, but, you know, talking about um, we language draws tautologies, it draws equivalences, it draws opposites, and we understand the world by drawing, uh, by drawing contrast, and we understand the world through difference, and, you know, we've had this whole, this whole, you know, De Derridean phase in the philosophy of language where we talk about antinomies and all this stuff. So, I mean, it seems to me that, if Parmenides is arguing that oneness is what it takes to understand the world, and you know, it seems to me that the Heraclitian view here is much more, because it seems that we require difference in some ways, you know, yes. to make sense of things. Well, we're difference machines, in some. I mean, <laughs> well, there we go. Right, right. That that we that in fact, it's only in it's only. Uh, it's responding to difference that allows us to talk about entities at all. Mm -hmm. And just and uh, and that we key all of our sense of distinction based upon being sensitive to different uh, to differences. Yeah, yeah, and take solace in the fact that Parmenides existed in a world where he essentially, I mean, he thought that to speak of something that was not is to be making meaningless sound. Like you, you can't even talk about things that aren't, and that you know all change in motion is a complete illusion. To him, he has to reconcile how he explains seeming differences in the world. It, he he lived in a world where he thought it was a complete illusion. I mean, that is the world. It's just, it's it's crazy to me. And then on the other end, Heraclitus has to. Why are you laughing at me, Dylan? No, no, I I, 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 I I'm I'm smiling because I, I you know you you have a a knack for stating things so baldly that makes them both clear and funny at the same time. So, that's, so it's, it's delightful. You're mistaking my laughter for derision when it's delight. So to continue my genius rant, <laughs> Heraclitus <laughs> needs to account for a different problem, which is that if the world is seemingly all unchanging, what accounts for the ostensible order to it all? Yes. I, that's where I'd like to chime in, okay? So <laughs> that fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Yep. If you suppose that the world really is unintelligible, experienceable, and knowable, we can have direct acquaintance with it, but it's unintelligible because it's just so infinitely complex. So the intelligible part is just what we think of it. The rationality, the mathematics, the explanations, the, you know, turning these perceptual experiences into objects that have permanence, all of that intelligibility business is what we've added. That's not that's not fundamentally real. That's where we misplace our concreteness. That's I all the abstraction. Uh, right, right, right. And this is where, where James comes, comes in, right? This, like yeah, this is where James we, comes we in. We have these abstractions because they work. They work, and that's what makes them true or not, is if they work. There we go. And what's concrete and what's real is the experience as such. Mm -hmm. That's the concreteness that it, where the concreteness is properly placed, according to James. Percy. So they're more empiricists than the empiricists. Ra they, they're called radically empirical because you know not because they're revolutionaries, but because they're going to the very roots of things. In effect, they're saying that experience and reality are the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's that's the ground. We have a, a foundation that's in flux. That's all, that's always what interested me about the pragmatists and the people. I mean, even people like Heisenberg and and uh, other people who claim to be like radical empiricists and how how they differ from the mainstream empiricists, right? You know, people who claim to be people who kind of profess this belief in you know this kind of stable um, a natural world governed by stable patterns and laws, which are which is clearly which are clearly intelligible, which have direct access to, and our sense experience is prized, right? You know, the kind of Lockean perspective, right? Stuff, stuff right. like that. And and if you actually follow their principles out to where where they take you, you come up with a totally different worldview than this supposedly, you know, stable, predictable kind of, you know, st almost weirdly static world. 
yeah, you end up with all kinds of problems. You know, how do you how do you get to this you know pre-existing objective world just from your sense data? There's this veil of ignorance between us and the real world, and this constant problem of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And and no, that that's the substance though. They're they're sort of predicated on a metaphysics of substance too. So the process philosophy is going to take that down um, as well as Newtonian physics and stuff. It's going to you know, do some damage to the traditional sensory empiricism of the 18th mm -hmm. century. And, and James was critical of them too. I mean, he's, still a, he's still an empiricist. He's going to be more sympathetic to you know, a Locke and a Hume than he is mm -hmm. to a Hegel or Kant. But it's it's a completely different kind of. But I mean, it's funny you say that. It's fun, funny you say that, and I and I would agree with you reading what I have of James. But a lot of what Whitehead says, and certainly the mention of Heraclitus, seems to be to be a nod towards Hegelian kind of dialectical <laughs> ontology. Yeah, Hegel he was, you know, he was doing a thing about becoming, and it was a kind of a quasi-theological thing too. So there, I, I see some affinity. But that, I, that's exactly what I don't like about Whitehead. I, <laughs> I think he's, you know, saying that we, we um, he's putting his concreteness in a in a different metaphysical substance. It seems to me. It, 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 I mean, I think there's reasons why when you bring up Hegel and seeing the link to this work, it reminds me that Dewey was Dewey was a, a Hegelian early on, right? Everybody was back in those days. Yeah. yeah, but 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 I guess I guess that makes me think of you know how you know how someone like Dewey uh, you know moves away from moves away away from Hegel, and I, I think I think yeah. it has to do with you know this fallacy of misplaced concreteness is another way of saying why you would why you would move away from Hegel. He it's I don't know too much about this period of his life, but it, it seemed to me that he was. Um, Using Hegel to critique the traditional empiricists, that you know sure. he, he talked about um, how we're first and foremost a social creature that uh, can later achieve individuality, as opposed to you know starting out with the self as an essential unit, mm -hmm. as opposed to over set over against an objective world, and then that knowledge problem. Dewey's using Hegel to deny that old school empiricism and then move into radical. Empiricism along with James, where the subject and the object are not entities; they're just features of the world. You know, there's human beings in their environment, but there's not this some epistemic gap yeah. between ourselves and the real reality. You know, quotes or capital R or whatever. <laughs> this is this is a this is a huge deal. It seems to me you're basically not only denying that traditional subject object um, dualism you see in Descartes, but you're also oh, I lost my train of thought now. Setting everything in motion. I'm sorry, I lost it. Okay, well you I think of that and I'll of I'll tap dance while you think of it, okay? And just like okay. chime in as soon as you remember it. Uh, let me think. Okay. Whitehead, change. Well I had a question. Uh um, to David, perhaps could he? When you when you talk, well, pragmatism seems to me to talk quite a lot about, or at least I mean, Whitehead talks a lot about our psychological reality. But I mean, this is common in terms of you know how we perceive things, how we misperceive things, and so on and so on. So I wonder if there is a subject-object distinction there, because when you talk about the subject perceiving and the subject not perceiving, and then the world and the human being, that seems to imply a subject-object distinction. But perhaps I'm mistaking it. That, um, I don't know if I can answer your question, but it does, does remind me where I was going with this. The, the subject-object right. yeah, uh, dualism is kind of like you know a modern version of the appearance-reality distinction. Cartesian, you know, right. Yeah, it, which is older than Plato's cave, but you know, well illustrated in that allegory. So we're all in this uh, shadowy world of empirical uh, illusions and the real world is somewhere else and you know, the mm -hmm. task is to get out into the light this 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 uh, process philosophy says that's a mistaken notion 
there's the, the appearance reality distinction kind of evaporates because right. the the appearance is reality experience is reality and then you know the only other sort of difference is, is are the ideas and abstractions that we add to the empirical phenomenal reality so right. you don't have reality versus appearance you have appearance versus concepts that's a different kind of dualism. We we have access to both. You know, neither one of those things is cut off from us. So there's not some unknowable world that we're trying to make our ideas correspond to. It solves an impossible epistemic gap, basically. Right. I mean, this this appears. I mean, even, a lot of people associate this kind of stuff with your know, continental rationalists with their crazy. Uh, you know, jumbled up theories, but you see it, you know, in like a lot of contemporary, you know, science lovers, and so you, you, I think both of you guys know who, who I'm referring to, in terms of, you know, you you talk about being skeptical and so on, but you have this belief in the, so these underlying stable laws of nature, and that, I mean, that's a belief in an underlying reality with beneath the appearance as well, isn't it? Like it's you know. yeah, I think I think that's right. I think. Modern realist physicalism is just the metaphysics of substance um, with a PhD. <laughs> There's a lot of elaborate theories, but you can think of you know the whole continuing body of science as almost like a self-contained thing, in, so that you just have to be right within science right according to other scientists and it has to agree with experience and everything but you're just sort of working this program it's just a lot healthier and um, saner I think to be a little more humble about it and say no we're not getting to the truth of the ultimate truth of the universe or anything like that we're just being careful about what we observe and perceive we're just being very careful about what experience contains and we're going to think as carefully about that as possible because we can. It's a powerful tool. It's so wonderful and powerful and awesome that we mistake it for reality. Not because it's you know because we're idiots, but because it's so convincing. David, does that make sense? no, it does. It was beautifully worded, and I'm wondering if any of you guys have lives that you need to get back to because we've been on this call for coming on two hours now. If you count the uh, a soliloquy before about why it's morally justifiable to eat meat. This is coming on two and a half hours. I'm wondering, do you guys, I mean, do you feel like what we've done is sufficient? Uh, I actually okay. do, do have to get going myself, but... Okay. So, D D David, what did you what did you say? I was just going to say I need a break at least. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I this is this has uh, been uh, great, and uh, Amog, Amog, I'm really glad you joined in. Uh, right. did, did did you know that it was going on earlier? You were you just late, or did you happen to just get a message from the citizen group and just decide to jump in? Or uh, I, I I knew it was happening. I, I'm unfortunately late. I expected it to be at two, like the last the Jasper's one, which I was. Ah, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. When did oh. it start? Where, where where are you located? I am in Toronto, so it's Eastern time. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, I I, Tor I love Toronto. My my uncle lived in Toronto for years and years and years, and we used to go visit him there. No, it's it's a cool place. Negative twenty now, unfortunately, but <laughs> oh, wow, you're colder than here. We're just we're, well, you're negative twenty C, right? So, yeah, yeah. We're we're, we're wow. like zero F. So <laughs> maybe we're about the same. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you joined us too. Mark. It was yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah, that was fun. It was nice to meet you as well, David. Amog, great. one of my closest friends. Uh, anyway, two so shows, talk, Stephen, two shows. You're a great host. You're a great counterpart, man. So I guess we should leave, right? I guess I should just stop broadcast and abruptly and awkwardly end this after show. Just, just say good, good, goodbye, everybody. Dylan <laughs> said it for me. Goodbye, everybody. Talk to you next. Thanks for good joining us. Bye, man. Adios. Have a good one.